Ah, Thank you. 
for seconds, we can hear something, but then it just goes away again. Not sure what's happening. I think it's the sounds of people joining online. I don't think it's the sound in the room. Oh, I see. Yeah, but and I think they're not seeing anything? us. No, I can't can you hear, hear anything. No. Yeah. no. Okay. Yeah. And someone else was saying also the same, so it might be that. Yeah, it's the case. Something's not working. Can you hear me now? I hear someone now. Yeah, yes. me too. We can hear you, Panella. Um, it's Caroline here. Can you hear me? Oh, Caroline, yes. <laughs> nice to meet you. At last. Okay, I'm really sorry that you've missed the first part of the presentation. You haven't missed much. <laughs> That's all right. We're all eager to hear the rest of it. I'm sorry, Thank you. We had a bit of technical uh, challenge setting up. No worries. Thanks for getting it sorted. Up, you, yeah, I'm just picking up from this. You can, can you see the slide? Okay. Yes, yes we see yeah. the slide. Yeah. So you just missed the overview, but you'll you'll pick it okay. up. I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Nice okay. Have you. Thanks. <laughs> OK, so I so I took, you know, Sen's threefold um, proposal around the role of human capabilities and I applied it to education um, to think about, um, you know, can, can education be sort of said to put, have the potential for these three roles to support the well-being um, and freedom of individuals, but also to, to influence economic production and also to influence social change. Um, and I've kind of run with that idea uh, for a while in terms of a potential aspiration. Uh, for education um, and then but then I've just added a few things in brackets here as uh, I guess as my thinking is evolving really but um, you know it, it's aspirational to think about not just the well-being of freedom of people but also of other species flora and the plant so kind of thinking about the sustainability uh, aspects and thinking about ourselves beyond beyond humans but trying to think about that, that bigger um, planetary picture um, and then in terms of influencing social change, again, just a bit more detail about cultural attitudes and, and priorities. And um, when we think about social change, what we're we thinking about. Um, and in terms of economic production, there's been kind of a kind of a long standing dominant discourse about economic growth and um, with people positioning growth as being kind of commensurate with development. There's, that's very contested in the literature as well. Um, but we see more coming through around this idea of degrowth and donor economics. Um, so where we think about economic production and development, starting to think about that in relation to what the planet can sustain, trying to think about all of our kind of roles in that. So again, this is still part of the aspirational kind of um, discourse around education. Um, and we've got the UN there saying education is the key that will allow other many other sustainable development goals to be achieved. So it's not just a magic pill, but it's also a kind of a golden key that can unlock a door and help them other, other things to happen. Um, so I think this is all sort of relatively aspirational. Um, and so um, what the paper highlights is that educational processes are not necessarily equitable um, and all of the education that goes on is not necessarily equally in everybody's interests. Um, and actually, you know that there is in, in many cases there are social hierarchies that are being reproduced through educational processes um, and so education is not necessarily a wholly positive advantageous um, phenomenon and entity for everybody who participates in it 
And so I wanted to focus particularly on three areas of, of inequality um, that are in the paper and that have um, uh, come out of research that I've, I've done previously. And these uh, relate to access to education in terms of formal education institutions. And we can be thinking about higher education institutions in this context, um, inequalities in relation to experience and inequalities in relation to outcome. And what we find is that learners have unequal opportunities to, uh, to realise their aspired and valued achievement. So if we're sort of thinking about access to higher education, um, this, this varies. And there are many reasons for this. So it might be to do with the actual physical locality of education institutions. It might be to do with the language of instruction in an institution. It might be to do with various rules and regulations about who is eligible to apply for a certain institution and um, the criteria that have to be met, the costs of the tuition. There are a whole host of factors that might influence some of the education. Uh, but what we know is that that, that um, equity and access is, 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 is variable and, and different people are able to, to actually enter these institutions. Uh, once their experiences are not all the same, um, and again, I've given examples in the paper, but um, here just uh, illustrating that for some people, they will have perhaps an immediate and lasting sense of belonging and affiliation um, and maybe feeling very culturally in tune with their higher education environment. But in other cases, people may feel quite lonely, quite isolated, and um, you know, may, may not feel that same sort of um, cultural resonance. Um, and then in terms of the outcomes, again, outcomes are not equitable. So you might find two people who studied the same subject at the same institution, they've got the same uh, level of qualification, the same degree classification, um, and yet their experiences of going out into the wider world beyond higher education to um, obtain work um, may just not be the same. So they may not have the same opportunities for work experience, apprenticeships, internships, um, they may not have the same connections. And so we sort of see this, this kind of pattern of, of inequality, if you like, permeating the process all the way through from access through to experience and through to um, outcomes. So um, I just wanted to read a little bit from the paper here that this that, so understanding this, the nature of equity in relation to the opportunities that individuals have versus those that they take up is not that well understood. So if, if traditionally we're just kind of looking at the figures of who's going into education and you know, how many people are kind of obtaining degrees, we can sort of see a growth in higher education participation and we can see that globally, it's different in different countries. Um, and, you know, we could perhaps look a bit more fine grained at gender or ethnicity characteristics and we'll kind of see certain things. But what we won't get is the whole picture of what freedoms and capabilities people have had to participate in education versus what we see in those figures. They are relatively limited. And that's where SEN's work on capabilities is, is very helpful because he encourages us to um, to have a more pluralistic view and to, and to think about what are the real freedoms um, that individuals have um, in whether they're choosing to access or not higher education in terms of the kinds of participatory experience that they can have and then in terms of the outcomes that they might be able to um, enjoy. Um, and in particular what we see is that there are um, people are differently able to convert resources into ways of being that they have reason to value. In, and here we're talking about the educational resource, the higher education resource. Um, and Bourdieu is very helpful in looking at some of the factors that enable somebody to convert an opportunity um, into a way of being. And I'm going to delve into that into a little bit more um, detail as we go on. Um, so here's just a little flow chart, and I'm going to kind of build this up through the talk, but this is just kind of the, the kind of the base starting point, really, and it, it, it's, it's based on Sen's um, earlier work, um, where we're kind of looking at um, commodities on the one hand, and I think many of you will be familiar with this, and uh, he was arguing that just looking at a kind of a resource-based evaluation is not enough, it's not enough just to say how much money has somebody got in the bank, or how many universities are there in your city, um, but it's to do with whether someone can convert that commodity, that resource, into a freedom, a way of living, a capability that they have reason to value. And so we get the little flow chart here going from commodities, the conversion to 
into capabilities um, and from there a further conversion of the, the set of capabilities from which an individual will select a combination of functionings that they have reason to value um, and so forth um, as the cycle goes around developing further capabilities and functionings. So that's the sort of the base model, if you like, um, of how you might sort of position capabilities and functionings in relation to commodities in a in a kind of a semian capability um, approach. Um, what I found in applying the capability approach coming from a sociological background was that, that the model was very helpful and informative in terms of this idea of um, how do you convert resources into tangible advantage and drawing attention to the inequities in that. But it was limited in what it told us about conversion factors. Um, and Ingrid Robbins is one of the scholars who has looked at this a little bit more. And she started to talk about personal, social and environmental factors that might come into the conversion process. But for me, it still, it just didn't kind of quite capture the social complexity um, that I was starting to see in this conversion process. So I wanted to unpack that a bit more um, and to understand, well, why are education benefits um, unequal? Problems of using my slides on my blind bit. Uh, okay, so so people have differences in conversion potential. I think that's sort of becoming apparent. Um, and as Sen is saying, that once we shift attention from the commodity space to the space of what a person can in fact do or be uh, or be uh, what kind of life they might lead, the source of interpersonal variations uh, can be numerous and powerful. And that's what we're trying to delve into a bit more. Um, and to understand the conversion factors at play throughout the process um, of an individual's capability and functioning development. And this is where I've turned to, to Bourdieu's what I call toolbox of sociological concepts to, to try and support thinking further. And there are three key concepts um, that I want to look at here, um, which are habitus, capital and field. And again, I'm sure that you know, some of these concepts may be familiar to, to, to many of you, um, but I am just going to go through and give a um, a few highlights just to kind of support the, the thinking around um, around the Seven Bourdieu framework. Um, so, so Bourdieu was a French sort of sociologist and public intellectual um, who was around around that 1930 to 2002, and he argued that an individual's social position is influenced not only by economic capital uh, but also by other forms of capital, including social, cultural, and symbolic capital. Um, so, augmenting really that kind of initial thinking, um, if we go back to rules and kind of the idea of resources and economic kind of basis for um, comparing people's sort of situation. And um, what Bourdieu is saying is, well, it's more complicated than that. It's not just about money or economic capital, but there is other different kinds of capital that come into play. Um, and he he argued in a quite a key publication in 1986, translated to English and French, uh, it is in fact impossible to account for the structure and functioning of the social world unless one reintroduces capital in all its forms and not solely in the one form recognised by economic theory. Um, and so just briefly, uh, here are different types of capital that he talks about. So we've got the economic capital, but then also social capital that might be accrued through social networks, through one's family, uh, wider social and community interactions. Um, but then also symbolic capital, which might be manifested in individual prestige and authority, um, titles and so on. Um, and then uh, crucially, cultural capital, uh, which might be ob embodied, objectified or institutionalised. And um, I'll come back to that institutional bit a bit later on. Um, so the possessors of strong educational capital who also have inherited strong cultural capital Bourdieu argues have this kind of dual title to cultural nobility, as he calls it, a self-assurance of legitimate membership and the ease given by familiarity. Um, and so it's, there's a kind of a cumulative effect of having different kinds of capital that actually support and enhance one another um, and give people a, a, a privileged position, really. Um, and uh, there's been other work that's followed on with a number of different scholars. Marjorie Banks is, is, is one of them, which I think I mentioned in the paper. Uh, where they're, they're kind of, they're suggesting that an individual may be able to accrue capital from, from family. So you may be able to kind of either inherit or, or gather 
um, um, uh, capital from um, from parents, for for example. Um, and I'll, again, I'll talk a bit more about that because it's not quite as obvious as it sounds. But there's this sort of idea that it's about capital is about the individual, but it's also about kind of those that they have access to where they might be able to accrue further capital. Um, of course, that could be a negative transfer. So if you've got a family, for example, that's in in debt. Um, or um, some other sort of challenging kind of circumstance, it may be that you then hold some kind of responsibility or obligation um, to support those other family members. Um, and so uh, can't make an assumption that the capital transfer is positive. It could actually, in fact, be, um, there could be a deficit there. Uh, but just to, so, to go back to the flow diagram again, so just as a bit of an enhancement here. So it's the same thing that you've seen earlier. But instead of it just saying commodities in the first um, box, it says commodities and forms of capital. Um, and I just found that quite useful in, in my thinking, in, in the way that I've applied this in research, to kind of just kind of expand the idea of what, what might be in this, this sort of commodity space. And these other kind of less tangible kind of cultural, symbolic um, and social forms of capital seem, seem important in that respect. Um, so <laughs> it might be quite tricky to see, it's quite small writing here. But um, this is the uh, is the original assembled year analytical framework, um, and what I, I what I did talk about originally, but I've kind of embellished a bit now, is the, uh, this idea that there might be uh, family capital uh, that an individual might draw on, but there could also be other forms of capital um, as well, um, and. Um, you can see it, well, you may not be able to see at the top, but I'll read it out, but above the blue arrows, so the, the blue arrows are denoting the conversion factors um, from capital to capability and the functionings. Um, and what it says up there, I'll read it out. Oh, I would read it out, but the presentation's just disappeared. That's happened. Somebody else, yeah. somebody else is, somebody else is on the screen. Um, I don't know if somebody's using a mouse on the screen, but I think it's affecting the presentation. <laughs> like someone's hijacking the presentation. <laughs> Somebody else is in control. No, I can't. It's not. It's not responding to my mouse. Someone's. Someone's got. Someone's got the paper open on their screen. I don't know who that is, but if you, I think it might be somehow. If you try to take control. Wait, so I do. There shouldn't be. There should be. Somebody's sharing their screen. I think so. We need to. Stop sharing the screen. Right at the top of the, the menu bar on the furthest left, the take control option turns nothing. Can you click on that and then allow it to? So keep going left if you can. So you want to write at the top of the next bit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Oh, so you see how this is already. Yeah. Yeah. No, it says I've not got control, so we've totally lost. So um, we might have to stop the meeting and start again then, because I don't know. So, I don't know. I don't know. I think so, I think somebody who's watching the presentation has got control of the screen. Mm -hmm. Come back again. Then. Okay, right. Let's. Okay. I'll try and carry on. Okay, I'll carry on. <laughs> Okay, so this is the Sembolgia analytical framework. 
Um, where the blue arrows are, that's just denoting the, uh, the conversion factors that we talked about earlier. But um, what I'm highlighting here is that um, the transfer of family or other forms of capital is not guaranteed or straightforward. Um, there's a process of um, activation that has to happen and a process of transfer. So, for example, there might be wealthy parents, they might have a son and they might have a daughter. They may choose to fund the son to go and have a higher education experience, pay all the fees and maintenance, and they may choose to not support the daughter. OK, so that's an example of where there is family capital, but it isn't being transferred to the female in the way that it's being transferred to the male. Um, similarly, in terms of the cultural capital, same scenario, you may have a family that have lots of cultural capital um, and they might may try to teach their children certain ways of being, such or kind of cultural dispositions and so forth. And it may be that there's one child who grows up and is very well able to activate um, that cultural capital to put it into practice. Uh, maybe they're quite outgoing, they're quite confident, and they've got the kind of um, social know-how to put things into practice that they've learned from their family background. Uh, but then you might have um, another child who grows up in the same family, with access to the same family cultural capital, but they're not able to activate it in the same way. And so what the framework is, is showing is that uh, the conversion factors might be different for different individuals, even in the same family, because there might be different factors at play in the likelihood of transfer um, from family to offspring um, and in the ability for the offspring to activate um, the, that capital. Um, so I've made a sort of slight um, extension to the model um, to say a little bit more about external. So I talk about other forms of capital in the original model, but here I'm talking about external forms of capital, just really to try and capture the forms of capital that exist outside of the individual. So the individual embody a certain amount of, of cultural and social uh, capital. They might have access to a certain amount of economic capital, but beyond themselves, um, potentially in their family, but it could be potentially in the, the educational institution of which they are a part. Um, that educational institution, for example, US, uh, US may, um, may have uh, forms of capital um, that might be transferred to the individual student, and which they might be able to activate in order to pursue ways of being that they have reason to value. Um, but similarly, external forms of capital could come from community, um, they could come from known or unknown other external sources. Um, one of the people that was uh, driving me around in the taxi earlier this week was talking about how uh, he'd driven someone around in a taxi and he was talking about his love of languages and how he wanted to learn more. And, and the person that he was driving around happened to have a, a, a language teaching company and he gave this guy a plane ticket to, to fly off to South America to, to learn Spanish. Um, so it, the external forms of capital can, can be kind of multiple, might be known, might be unknown. Um, but I just wanted to capture that I think that educational institutions fall into this category potentially um, as a potential source of, of additional or augmented capital for the individual. Um, and so I'm just showing it. So this is kind of, if you like, the extended uh, analytical framework uh, based on Saint and Bourdieu. And it's showing that I've just highlighted in a different colour, external forms of capital, uh, taking account of institutional. Uh, capital as well as the other forms that I mentioned there. Um, so in terms of just sort of thinking through a bit further the conversion factors from a Bourdieuian point of view, um, he's got these three tools that we're going to look at, so habitus, um, capital and field, so we've kind of looked at the capital, so just moving on to habitus, so described as a habitus of an individual is related to the cultural and familial roots from which a person grows, um, it operates below the level, level of calculation and consciousness, and he explains it as the formation of the habitus being manifested in the agent's tastes, preferences and works. And so you might think about this as kind of habits, customs, dispositions that an, in, that an individual has, um, which may well have come from um, a family background, from, from one's upbringing, uh, but may also be developed in relation to um, others that they come into contact through community and, and other um, life experiences. Um, but people often say it's, it's, it is formed early in life. Um, uh, Bourdieu, I think, has argued in a quite a deterministic fashion that your habitus tends to kind of settle and um, kind of have a, a, a kind of a, a permanence to it in a way. Others have disputed that and said, actually, 
um, habits is something that can mm. continue to evolve and, and kind of be um, uh, developed in, di in different ways. Um, so we could sort of say then that habitus is constituted by an individual's embodied dispositions and manifested in the way that they view the world. And it influences one's ability to perform in appropriate ways in a field um, by aligning with the recognised tastes or preferences associated with that space. And I'll say a bit more about Audio's um, definition of, of, of field um, shortly. Um, but he says it's in the two capacities which define the habitus, the capacity to produce classifiable practices and works and the capacity to differentiate and appreciate these practices um, that represents social, the social world, i.e. the space of lifestyles is constituted. Um, so he's sort of saying there's kind of two bits of this. So one of, one of them is being able to kind of read the situation and to kind of work out what are the kind of, um, what are the practices that are kind of, if you like, preferred or privileged. And the second is being able to perform those preferred or privileged practices in order to, to get on, as it were. I think it's quite problematic, this, this idea that we might need to kind of adapt to kind of what's going on in the space in order to kind of fit in and be recognised and acknowledged. Um, but he is drawing attention to what is a very important power dynamic um, that is prevalent, uh, whether we like it or not. What we do about that, I think, is something else. But I think he, he very usefully draws attention to the power dynamic that's there. Um, and so the third concept that hopefully brings this together is um, Bourdieu's concept of field, uh, which comes from the French Le Champ, uh, which has been used to describe an area of land or a battlefield or a field of knowledge. Um, and I think perhaps it's the middle definition that's closest to Bourdieu's idea of, of what he talks about as a socially competitive space. So he's, what he's, I guess what he's adding in some ways to, um, then goes into a lot of detail about the individual and what their experience is. And what Bourdieu is talking about is kind of where is that individual positioned in relation to the wider um, social context. And he's illustrating that this it is socially competitive. Um, he talks about a configuration of relations between individuals and other individuals in a given field um, and within a you know, particular um, institution or, or sphere of life. Um, and he's sort of saying that, you know, there's this kind of game being played and there's, there's currencies that are being um, um, kind of um, activated, if you like, um, and that depending on what capitals you've got and how able you are to appropriately activate those capitals, <coughs> how, um, how well essentially you get on in the field or how well you get on in the game. Um, so I think this idea of a, of a get, of the field being a game uh, that's socially competitive, I think it, it's it's very very useful. Um, I think it does depend a little bit on the um, kind of what's the kind of the, the dominant paradigm, if you like. Um, but in, in a lot of cultural contexts, the kind of an, an individualistic, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of competitive um, uh, cultural norm is is prevalent. It's not the same everywhere, but that, but it is quite common. Um, but people do feel that they are in competition with other people for potentially limited resources, for jobs, for opportunities and, and so on. Um, and so um, what Borgia is saying is the earlier a player enters the game, the less aware he, no he <laughs> or she or they, are aware of the associated learning. Um, and so if you're entering uh, what might be seen as quite a middle class milieu um, of a you know, higher education institution, for example, um, it, if, if, if that's the background that you've grown up in, you might find it really easy to just kind of fit in and kind of, you know, you already know the ways of being, you already know what the tastes and preferences are that will be acceptable and, and will kind of get, help you to get on in that situation. Whereas if, if that isn't the background that you're from, it, it may actually be much more difficult because you don't really know what the rules are. You, you can't recognise the preferences and the, the tastes that are uh, that are privileged and, and you're not able to then display those. Um, and so he's just sort of analysing this kind of how the game, how the game works. Um, mm -hmm. Also saying that the game is, is devoid of an inventor and much more fluid and complex than any game that one might ever design. So it's almost impossible to know what the rules of the game are without learning them within the game. So if, if you're kind of coming late to that game because it's not something that's been in your kind of family experience or your earlier life experience, it's going to be a lot harder for you to, to work out how to, essentially how to play the game. Um, so the, 
again, in, in terms of the model, I've kind of just tried to extend the thinking a little bit. So, so when we think about a field, um, we're sort of thinking about different players and they've got different capital that they're using in, in different ways. Um, but the reason why I put this up is because I think um, the biggest game of all is our existence. That, that's the biggest game of all. And people are much more aware now of sustainability and climate change and, and the planetary potential to support humanity alongside other species. Um, and so this is becoming like a really big thing. And the, I think there's an important question to be asked here. Uh, how much advantage can some players take in the field without it having a catastrophic effect on other players in the field? So it's one thing to talk about inequality and somebody's kind of good at playing the game and they've got lots of capital that's highly valued and so they're, they're kind of better off in the game. But actually what we're now seeing is where people are, um, they're so privileged and they're overusing, if you like, their position so much that it's actually got a potentially catastrophic effect on other people in the game, um, let alone other species. And so what I've just put up here as an illustration, it's, it's, it's called the country overshoot um, kind of diagram, if you like. And you can, you can look this up, there's lots of different ones. And there's other sort of versions that look at our relative carbon footprints and things. But what it's showing is, is what day in the, by what day in the year, if we lived in the manner of these countries, would we get to the country overshoot day, which is basically where we've kind of, we've topped out on our, um, our sustainability resources. If, once we go past that day, we're kind of overusing our kind of allocation of, of resource to continue kind of existing without having catastrophic climate change. Um, and if, and uh, I know you won't be able to see the detail of this, but just suffice it to say that, you know, some of the countries are getting to their overshoot day by February, um, and for others, it's actually uh, December. So if we all, if we lived in the manner of people in Jamaica, we'd get to the middle of December before we got to um, kind of the Earth overshoot day. Um, but if we live in the manner of Australia, for example, um, by March, we're kind of into that kind of overshoot. And so I just, I just think it's really important that when we're kind of, we're sort of thinking about this configuration of power relations uh, in a field, we might be thinking about a fairly small field in quite a specific um, educational institutional context but actually the big picture the biggest game in town is actually how long can we survive on the planet for um, and that's where I think this this kind of comes in and um, yeah, I think it shows the relevance of, of Bourdieu's work in this sense and kind of showing that power dynamic. Um, so I feel like we've lost a little bit of time and so I feel like I've still got a little bit of time left um, I'm going to slightly skip over this, but we can come back to it if we want. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about, so in addition to an individual's well-being, freedom, so their own capability to live a life that, that they have reason to value, um, individuals also have this transformative potential. Um, and so again, I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with um, Sen's concepts of well-being, freedom, agency freedom. Um, and so I'm just kind of showing this here. So on the left-hand side, you've got the individual's um, essentially capability or freedom um, to do things that they care about for themselves. But we've also got agency freedom, the freedom an individual has to do things that will influence people beyond themselves um, and to achieve things for people beyond themselves. Um, and I think there's a strong sustainability piece in there as well, which I know some of us have talked about over the last few days. So the key point here is that if we compromise an individual's well-being freedom, so if we compromise an individual's um, capability within higher education because we've configured it in a very unequal way, where certain people are privileged in that space and others are not, we're not only um, it's not only a problem for that individual. We're not only losing out on, on their them living a flourishing life and everything that that might entail, but we're also losing out on their capacity for agency freedom and how that might have a positive effect on people beyond themselves. So this is kind of a double um, double whammy there in a way. Um, and again, in, in a lot of my work, I've argued that values and aspirations are really key. And in fact, they're actually the forerunner to all of this. So even before we get to the, um, the capabilities aspect, um, the values and, and aspirations, uh, for me, they kind of un underpin that and they're kind of and their forerunners. So, so understanding what's really important to people uh, before we start to look at how well they're able to convert commodities into 
um, the ways of being um, feels fairly crucial. Um, and so again, I've just extended um, the, the kind of the same view of well-being, freedom, achievement, and agency, freedom and achievement to add in aspiration as a pre-step. So the first step to well-being is actually the capability to aspire and to actually have aspirations about what somebody does in fact want for themselves. That for me comes before the evolution of the of the capability, the freedom to do it, and the realization of that. So just to sort of conclude then, um, um, Bordu has talk, he talks about this kind of the illusion of neutrality. So, so going back to the beginning where we're kind of talking about this kind of the magic pill, the panacea of education. But in fact, that this is a complete illusion. Um, it, you know, education could be a force for good. It might be a force for good. Many people might benefit, uh, but it's certainly not neutral. Um, and he sort of argues that really the kind of the first step is to become conscious of the illusion and in fact Friere talks about this as well this this, this process of being conscious is, is, is that that's the real the step to change um, and so um, before we can kind of change the game we need to understand the game um, and that I think probably can be said to be true of, of learners teachers policy makers and importantly researchers as well um, so becoming conscious of the complex complexity of conversion practices it enables us to ask a new order of questions and I was just going to just read a little bit from um, from the conclusion of the paper because I think it just sort of captures, um, I suppose, the essence of what I'm saying here about how I think that the framework can be can be kind of helpful to us. Um, and it kind of covers really sort of kind of practice, kind of research and, and policy, which all, all seem to me to be kind of important parts of how we can start to address um, some of the inequalities here and how we can kind of move to, to greater social justice. Um, so regarding practice, becoming conscious of the roles of educational institutions in the perpetuation of injustices and oppression is a first step on a long journey of development. Measuring inequality using SEND's concepts of capabilities and functionings will illuminate pathways for addressing some of the most prevalent and deep inequalities that currently dampen individual aspiration and capability formation. Innovative pedagogies are called for that seek to work more collaboratively than competitively and that resonate with Friere's notion of dialogic action. In other words, the oppressed need to consciously become part of the resolution of the injustices perpetuated through structural inequalities and the symbolic violence and cultural arbitrary foregrounded by Bourdieu and Passeron. The development of educational curriculum and pedagogical practices, a drawing on capability approach are, are now widely discussed in, in many texts, including some key work by, uh, by Melanie. Um, and a key challenge for us to think about is to how to sort of respond to this potentially pessimistic um, picture that Bourdieu painted in his time of education being a process of social reproduction and reproducing um, the old kind of social hierarchies. Um, and clearly a lot of his work was in, was in Europe and it was very kind of class-based. Um, but I think we can still take the essence of that and think about, we're thinking about inequality, so whether that's on the basis of race or gender or class or ability or disability, um, I think this, the same thing kind of holds true, really. This idea that can we can we challenge the idea that, that there has to be social reproduction? Can it can it somehow be different? Um, and I think some of the work that we've talked about over the last um, couple of days around sustainability and around decolonization, I think, are really good examples of where actually what I think you you are optimistic. You're not pessimistic because you believe that change can happen. And I think if we're looking at the assembled year framework, actually where you're focusing is you're focusing on, on the field and actually changing the field, changing the social configuration of relationships and changing the power dynamic, which I think is really important. Um, so educational policy must go hand in hand with practice developments. Education policy has a dominant focus on the development and um, education of children and young people, um, but also um, of adults as well. And so we need to kind of think uh, kind of more, more deeply about that and what the implications of that are. The implications of the wider external constraints on the outcomes of education, for example, related to employment and discrimination, call for policies to be intersectional, operating across education, employment and other aspects of social, commercial, legal and political life. And somebody had a really good example earlier, I think it was in a workshop this morning, where you were talking about uh, migration, immigration policies. And education policies and we've had the same thing in England as well where um, actually they intersect so it, it's important that kind of different areas of society in terms of policy making 
are aligned to, to make this work for everybody's benefit in a more equitable kind of a way. And then finally, just in terms of research, um, Bourdieu argued that it's only by making a second break, this time with the illusion of the neutrality and independence of the school system, or higher education system, with respect to the structure of class relations, that it becomes possible to question research into, for example, examinations. So to discover what examinations hide and what makes research into examinations only help to hide by distracting inquiry from the elimination which takes place without examination. So it, in other words, it's only by, by as researchers as, being, as becoming conscious that all of this um, the sort of power dynamics is going on that we kind of start to maybe think differently about what are the important questions to ask in terms of research and what are the important um, areas that we need to study um, and to kind of look beyond those areas of study that may be up until this point hiding um, hiding that, that kind of true uh, picture. And so I just argue that the synthesis of Sen and Borgia's perspectives within uh, this analytical framework, and they do call for a new order of questions and inquiry to challenge the status quo and normative perceptions of educational processes. And my belief is that this has profound implications for our research and endeavours and the question we ask um, as much as for our policies. and then you can respond to that if you want to throw it on or we can carry on sort of connecting bits and paste stuff. Thanks. Thanks uh, very much, Julian. And so I had the pleasure to read your paper and I decided to uh, streamline my response by talking about <laughs> the limitations of only focusing on access to higher education and really ignoring what happens once young people access higher education. So I think, um, First of all, your presentation is really contextually relevant to the kind of work that we're doing at the center, and at least most of the projects that have been presented here at the center. And there has been a lot of work that has been done on access, certainly by us here and by other scholars in South Africa, and especially the enrollment of um, certain specific groups in South Africa, for example, um, historically disadvantaged individuals like black people. And in other African countries, there's been focused on really including girls or women in higher education, as well as people living with disabilities. But we know that uh, when those people access higher education, there are many complex challenges that they experience once they get in. And needless to say, they bring in their own complex lifestyles within the education system. And um, I think this is something that has been um, ignored over time, especially in policy. And there's a lot of evidence that um, often most of these complex challenges are the key reason why most people drop out of university. Right? That's why at the end of the day, we have really low um, graduating rates, which is um, which, which is counterproductive towards the policies that we try and um, uh, address. And then when you look at young women, for example, um, I work with uh, young women in Zimbabwe and in Nigeria. There is a strong interaction in terms of uh, in the classroom experience when we're thinking about primary schools, secondary schools. There's a lot of inter interaction uh, between the classroom, uh, the school environment, um, the environment where they come from, for example, the household, as well as the communities where they um, where they are brought up. And um, the policies also not only influence how young women actually experience education in these educational institutions. So um, if you think about young women accessing education, the argument is all, always very persuasive, right? There are many reports about the economic and social benefits of, of women accessing um, education, but also there is a growing body of literature that shows that education can actually create or intensify challenges that women experience in, in education. I think this goes back to the to the Bordeaux argument that, that we experience education differently in this in this settings. Um, uh, there's an example that uh, a Nigerian colleague of mine actually gave. Uh, she said that actually in Nigeria, the sex work rates issue is actually happening at this point. So we might have women accessing higher education, but the, the experiences that they have 
are actually um, counterproductive towards the policies we're trying to achieve. When thinking about young people generally, I think there is a, a limitation um, that only access to higher education by young people is the solution to the complex life that they actually live. And there are other dimensions. I think uh, if we think about the economic vectors, right? The social, environmental, political, and personal convergent vectors that the institutions or that education generally tends to tends to ignore. And I think this is again where the capability approach becomes very instrumental in understanding those those experiences. Um, I think I heard you speak about loneliness. Actually, it reminded me of my recent workshop in Nigeria where we asked young people. Uh, so they were very good in reciting what they are taught in, in class. But when you ask them about the experiences in school, they spoke about loneliness, that they felt lonely in school. So um, that's another dimension. And in terms of what this means for policy, because when I read the paper, I was really thinking about what does this mean for policy to continue advocating for, for access and ignoring the other dimensions that are found within educational institutions. I think. Um, like I'm saying, increased enrollment rates and access that have been used to be the defining indicators of a socially just education system, if I can miss that, but it creates really a false sense of policy achievement or successful policy. And there's a danger in that it can lead policymakers to think that promoting only access is the is a significant intervention or solution to unjust education systems. And without obviously considering that, um, like you say, the playing field is not even for all people that are actually access higher education. And um, just to conclude uh, my reflections, I think um, the combination of Fen and Bojo, it definitely helps us understand the freedoms that the, the different people that access higher education actually have in interacting in a very complex and complicated playing field. And in other ways, I think now we are more really um, encouraged to think of education beyond the education outcomes and the elevated notions of that. Once you get an education, then you're going to get a good job or you're going to help your family live a better lifestyle. And it helps us to move now to thinking about more encompassing factors that, uh, in addition to the instrumental benefits of education, right, there is. Um, a need to think about the experiences and the discoveries and the different cultures that actually take place within the education system. And I think all of those experiences are really important for, for human adaptation and how we understand the life that we need to live and giving back to, so, to society. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, thank you very much uh, for your talk, uh, Caroline. And as Faith was saying, for me, it really did an excellent job you know, your presentation of highlighting these uh, patterns of inequality that you were describing as permeating across access experiences and outcomes. And it made me think I like to reflect on you know, projects that we're currently working on. So in, in some ways, I was thinking about the youth from an informal settlement here in the Free State who, despite their geographic proximity to institutions of higher education, are in every other sense far away from accessing university. Um, I thought about the students who are currently within the system that we're working with in another project, and they're trying to get universities to, to shift and change um, in terms of their values and the kind of outcomes that they will um, continue to kind of promote, especially for the future. So student activists who are trying to make a change um, in the system from being within it. And then in other projects, they were thinking about outcomes, right? So looking at what happens to university students once they've ex exited um, the system. And again, how geography, capital, and all these other factors intersect in very complicated ways so that you don't necessarily have a guaranteed sort of positive um, outcome. So I thought the paper um, and your presentation did an excellent job of reminding us of all of those complexities. Um, I did wonder about a few things um, that you mentioned that kind of stood out to me. So when you were talking about privilege and the different ways that it can be overused or abused, and I, I was wondering if there are ways that you thought about in your own work, kind of um, for us as educational researchers or high educational researchers to call out privilege or people who abuse, potentially abuse the privilege that they have, um, but in a way that also calls them in, so not just pointing an accusatory uh, you know, finger, 
that people who have, whether it's deliberate or the various means that you, you mentioned before, have accumulated um, capitals um, that they're uh, bringing to uh, their advantage. And then the second question I had is whether uh, you, since you know, writing the paper, and you know, you've said you've been reflecting over over time about some of the um, ways in which you know your thinking can progress. If there are other theories, whether it's study theories or decolonial thought and so on, that you might uh, bring to bear on, on these questions to help us ask the different questions, um, especially when it comes to changing changing the game, understanding it differently. Um, and then the third one was whether we should be thinking about educational inequalities in terms of epistemic justice more specifically. And I know that obviously epistemic justice is a dimension of any justice within the broader sort of uh, discussion around social injustices, but should we be um, speaking more directly about educational inequalities as epistemic injustices? Thank you. For a response. Just trying to capture, just to make sure I don't forget. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so the one is a comment where you were talking about um, where the impact of of exclusions on uh, on people's agency. So it, it it disables them from using their agency to contribute to the lives of the other. So it's just a comment um, in that in in Ubuntu philosophy and thinking. It would also see, it would also include an impact on the well being of others on the basis of the fact that if one person's well being is reduced, then others cannot have full well being either, even if they seem privileged. So that, that's a comment. Um, the other is more about the theoretical frames that, that you're working with, and there are two questions. The so one is, um, I think you began with sin, but you might have begun with audio, but it doesn't matter whichever one you began, began with. What was missing for you um, in sin that led you to, to walk with audio? That's the one question. And then the second thing in, in walking alongside these two um, sort of major thinkers, what for you was the challenge of bringing sin, the economist, philosopher, and I think an optimist? into conversation with Bourdieu, the sociologist and the skeptic. So if you want to have a go, we'll no. get those. Okay, so I thought I was sort of five questions there. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go back to make the second go first. But, um, so thank you. I mean, lovely, lovely reflections as well. And um, yeah, both, I mean, I, I agree. And I think that, that the kind of the, the context that you're, the local, the more local and regional context I think it's really helped as well. So thanks for the reflections. But, um, so the first question from the from Mikiteko then was around that kind of the what do we do about the people who are kind of privileged and kind of overusing their kind of fair share? And I think I mean, the sustainability issue is the kind of the biggest one, but I think you could probably see other areas. I mean, I don't think there's a simple answer to this, but it feels like to me that the, the starting point, well, there's there's two bits to it. I think one is people will change their behavior. If, if it's something that they value, if they, they care about it, then most of them motivate, they have an internal value and motivation to change that behaviour. Or because there's a suitable incentive to get them to change their behaviour, or because there's a sanction that will force them to change their behaviour. Um, and for me, my starting point would, would generally be to work with the values first. That might be one of the hardest to work with, but if you can, people hold the value and the motivation to want to do something, that's ultimately probably more sustainable and powerful than the reward or sanction. Um, but those other ones, you know, they kind of are there. So that's one bit to that. And the second bit to it is that I think, um, and again, different in different cultures around the world, but um, certainly in the global north context, it's a very individualistic, competitive, dominant paradigm that we live in. So we are not encouraged to, to work with peers, even in schools, in higher education. There might be a little bit of group work, might be a little bit of project work, but on the whole, we are uh, we are in competition with one another for the grades, kind of who's got a higher level of degree than someone else. Um, and we generally speaking are expected to do our work alone. And um, you know, so there is, I'm not saying there's no group work, there is, but there's a there's a lack of collaboration, there's a lack of community and networking 
and fellowship is what I would say. And I think if we could, if we can promote that more, and then you have more of a sense of commitment, and, and some talks a lot about commitment and or obligation to others, then that's another key driver, I think, for someone to moderate their behaviour in relation to others. And um, together with, with the transparency and awareness of what is actually happening. So I think when you look at, um, I mean, you'll, again, you'll see all of these figures, but you'll sort of see, you know, the, um, the wealth is sort of 10% using 50% of the carbon footprint of the, of the world kind of thing. If you're not aware of that, you're not likely to change your behaviour. So there's a thing about becoming aware, and then there's a thing about caring, and then there's a thing about knowing who your fellow, you know, humans or other species are that you might want, want to do it for. Um, on the on the southern theory, um, yes, I definitely think that. I mean, this is just what I've done. It's just a starting point, and I think it is quite. You could argue it's quite Eurocentric because I'm, you know, I'm using Bourdieu, who's a, like I say, who's a French white male, <laughs> you know, um, and and very much kind of looking at the the French class based system. Um, I guess what I've tried to do is make it more globally relevant by by kind of saying um, I think it has a conceptual relevance to other types of inequality, but I think that it definitely is useful to, to give some local context to that. And I think that um, Southern theory and uh, some of the concepts that we've talked around Africanisation, I think can usefully be uh, brought into conversation with the framework to kind of understand more about what, that, what does that mean on the ground, for example, here in, in South Africa. So I, I agree with you that I think it could do with that, uh, being augmented with that um, additional theory in a specific context. And, and actually, Sen, Sen talks about that in relation to like capabilities and lists as well. That, that you know he encourages bringing in other relevant theories. So it might be gender-based theory or you know the other types of theory that could be relevant for the particular kind of context. Um, and on epistemic justice, I, don't, I think I need to think about that a bit more. But I think it's a really good point that you raised. I'd be interested in what other people's kind of thoughts on that are. Um, but I think. Yeah, there is some sort of central questions as to you know what 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 should justice look like, what and what could what's the pragmatic what could justice look like, um, and I think probably for me I, I take a Stenian position uh, rather than a Rawlsian one, which is rather than trying to find the perfect justice to to just chip away at the gross injustices that are there because I think they're really apparent um, and I think we've got quite a lot to be going on with really. Um, on so on Melanie, what what was missing? Well, really, it was to do with I didn't feel that the the theorization of the conversion factors was nuanced enough. So it didn't it didn't capture the complexity, and it was very apparent in some of the work that I was doing with with young people around aspirations for higher education and what mattered to them. And they started to bring in all sorts of other stuff around housing, employment, culture. Um, I mean, I remember, you know, young people saying to me the reason they wanted to go to university was just to get away from the place where they lived. It wasn't really about university; it was getting escaping the place where they lived. And you know, asking why did they want the graduate education? It's because I don't want to live in debt like my mum and dad. Um, and so, actually, it became really obvious that there were loads of other factors at play. Um, and I just felt it, there just needed to be something more there. And I felt like, yeah, ultimately, I mean. Probably use other theorists, but I thought for me, Bourdieu kind of resonated. Um, the challenge of this is interesting because I remember we actually we had a conversation about twenty years ago when I when I um, did a little presentation on Senna Bourdieu, and I think it well, I do think it was not name, but maybe it was someone else who we went, you can't put them together, and it's definitely been said several I've uh, presented and taught, and there are some people who feel Sen uh, Bourdieu is, is if you might think of him as a structural and deterministic kind of sociologists um, and quite you know kind of it's like this is how it is kind of thing and I think uh, Sen on the other hand is a kind of an eternal optimist um, and there's that kind of sense that things you know can be different um, so yeah I think I think I suppose I'm, I'm not trying to be pure Bourdieu or pure Sen I'm trying to take their thinking and use it in a way that is helpful and, and I think I think that's what I've achieved. So I don't think I'd say I'm 100% through to either one. I've tried to take kind of the, the kind of the essence that I feel is um, helpful. Great. Thanks very much. Um, before I turn to the online group, is there anybody here who wants to make a comment or ask a question? <laughs> 
you want to think about it a little bit more? Okay, think about it a little bit more. Um, I can only see um, Carmen's hand, but I can't see all the yes. So just hang on. Are there any other hands up? No. Okay, uh, Carmen, go ahead with your question. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Caroline, uh, for this lovely presentation, because I could really see your thinking as you were bringing together the ideas between uh, Sen and Bourdieu. Um, uh, apologies if I'm going to bring um, things a bit um, unorganized, uh, but I think I just want to push um, a bit in some elements that I'm struggling myself with. And I think the issue is uh, because, you know, um, when I was doing my PhD, I got interested in Bourdieu. And I thought, um, as you said, it's really powerful because it's a strong critique of inequalities and it really draw the boundaries and the rules of the game. And he is certainly uh, deterministic and, and a structuralist in, in sociological terms. So I think he is really appealing, you know, when we want to highlight inequalities. But we know now that that is dangerous because it creates this uh, paternalistic and deficit view if we use it just to highlight, right? And I think, you know, your intuition was telling you, okay, Sen can contribute here, you know, with um, uh, the primacy of the individual, the complexity, the agency, and bring complement, you know, the, the gap of conversion factors, which is the ontological um, uh, gap of the capability approach, because it's not uh, necessarily a theory in, in sense understanding, it's more epistemological ground. Uh, but but then when you were explaining, because my struggle to use Bourdieu and Sen, it was exactly the struggle that, that, that you are dealing with in terms of agency. But for me, I found that even bringing the capability approach, it wasn't enough. And through the presentation, I was thinking that probably the reason is, and I didn't know then, and maybe it's more clear now in my head, is that when we talk about external forms of capital, as, as you were uh, highlighting, we need to talk about also internalized uh, capital in terms of the performativity that uh, feminists talk. And I wonder whether that will fix the, the limitation of the capability approach on Bourdieu, because for me, it's not a question whether we go to an extreme structuralist or an extreme individualism, because I don't think the capability approach is doing that. It's not ontologically individual, right? It's an epistemological ground. But I think feminists can bring that individualist level in performativity, so it's internalized, and therefore it creates an internal responsibility towards others. So it's not necessarily because, I mean, we teach in universities about social inequalities and about the need, you know, to take to take care of our planet and so on. But I think the issue here is that uh, what we are not getting in the picture is that there is a social discourse and uh, dynamics and there are also performativity within the internalized individual. And this performativity is the one that is closely related to habitus and make the choices and create the preferences. And I think while we've been really good in higher education, you know, highlighting these structural constraints, we've been really uh, badly doing it at this performativity and internalized um, a capital that we need to create that responsibility uh, towards others in a in a truthful way, right? Not in a paternalistic way in which we are teaching uh, people to act, right? Uh, or to do what what we want them to do because we know better, right? Um, so I use I use as I said, um, those are ideas that I've been struggling my myself. And, and then that brings me to the point that your distinction between well-being individual and agency as the collective, it won't be enough. So because the well-being in sense aspect doesn't capture 
that internalize performativity. And therefore, what you're trying to say is not necessarily, I understand the point of the capability to aspire, because of course, in Bourdieu terms, you know, we need to open up the structure, you know, and the capability approach allow us, you know, through that freedom of thinking otherwise. Uh, but I was thinking that is it not more about the capability of being free from oppression and that capability cannot be articulated if we are not taking the, the internal performativity in relation to the structure. And this is exactly the point that um, uh, that uh, John de Jaeger is uh, making in the paper about relational ontologies, right? So it's exactly like looking in the cracks and not necessarily on the on the extremes. Uh, but again, I'm just gonna leave it leave it there. Yeah. Okay, carry on. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank, thank, thanks, Carmen. I, I think I think you've articulated some com some quite complex ideas really well there. And I think if you've not already written, you should definitely kind of write about this because I think what you're saying there about the internalized performativity, I think it's really important. Um, I mean, I didn't go into it in the presentation just because there was quite a lot a lot there, but I, I do think um, from Bourdieu, um, his concepts of um, symbolic violence is quite useful mm. a little bit in the in the paper but uh, that sort yeah. of idea that actually um the, the oppressed if you like are kind of subsuming the dominant culture almost unwittingly almost complicitly um yeah. and i think that you're speaking to that when you talk about that internalized performativity um yeah. and and I, I take and i and i agree i agree really with what with what you're saying there I guess the I don't know what exactly the resolution is, but what I see is that what ne what actually needs to happen is that um, I, I, I draw a bit on Paul, uh, Paolo Friere because I think he helps when he sort of says actually the oppressors need to kind of engage with the, the oppressed need to engage with the oppressors in order to kind of overcome the situation. And I think that is necessary. And I think ultimately what we need to do is work out how to change the rules of the game. But, the you know, in a way that kind of works for, for everybody and enables people to overcome that internalized performativity. So I think it, it's, it, your, your points are really valid. So thank you, Joan. Thank you. I have one last question, if there's anybody else who wants to ask this question. If you haven't read the paper, it was circulated. I do go back and have a look at it, it you know, especially having listened to the presentation, I'm sure the paper will, will be very, very rich. Okay, just can can we make the recording available? Okay, so it's then my very great pleasure to uh, thank Caroline for the seminar, to thank all the participants, um, to thank uh, all the people who commented and to who asked uh, asked questions. And um, just generally to extend our very grateful thanks to you for the last three days, which have been very rich. Again, to Moffat and to Tiffany for helping to, to organize events with the doctoral researchers and the postdoctoral researchers, to Lucretia, who's done a fantastic job of organizing, selecting our menus, sorting travel, and so on. And on behalf of the group, just a small gift which hopefully will remind you <laughs> of us um, when you get back to England. Oh, thank you. That's very nice. Okay. There is tea, so that's a little bit of a blessing. Thank you very much, everybody.